everybody. I am happy that you chose to come back and study with us again. I realize that there are so many places you could have gone. And so thank you. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again, we come to study your word. Once again, we're asking that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your fresh. Father, we pray that you would give us listening ears and, and hearts and minds to actually understand. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture has been and continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus has been and continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And we'll continue with our third declaration of freedom, which is freedom from discouragement, no frustration, and is found in Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 30. But I will read verses 26 through 30 out of the NIV. It reads, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with the, God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Now, even though uh, I only read verses 26 through 30, let us not forget that our discussion is based on verses 18 through 30 where Paul makes the contrast between the suffering of this present time to the future hope of glory. He speaks of creation groaning, believers groaning, and he speaks of the Holy Spirit groaning. And then just to throw in that when Jesus was ministering on earth, he also groaned when he saw that what sin was doing to mankind. Today, the Holy Spirit groans with us, and he also feels the burdens of our weakness and the suffering that we go through. But the Holy Spirit does more than just groan. He prays for us, and he helps us so that we might be led into the will of God. The Spirit intercedes for us so that we might also not only be led into the will of God, but we may live in the will of God in spite of our suffering. He shares the burdens, no matter what it is. And that should be a comforting thought and a reality in our lives. We really don't ever have to, or we don't ever have a reason to be discouraged or frustrated. Now, I know that that is easier said than done, but just because it's hard to do does not make it not so. It, it does not make it uh, uh, something that cannot be done. 
And, and so we are told countless times in the Bible to not to be in, discouraged. God said to Joshua uh, after Moses died and, and Joshua was up to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. God said in, in Joshua 1 and 9, he said, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. <clears throat> and as God's children, that's, that's encouragement. We never need to be discouraged or frustrated, even in times of suffering and times of trials. Um, why? Because we should know that God is at work in the world and he's at work in us. He has not left us to figure out this crazy world for ourselves. God has not done that. Romans 8 and 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Last time, we started to pretty much dissect that verse. We said that, the words, all things, go well beyond just the great events of the world. Uh, the tsunamis, the earthquakes, the tornadoes, the fires, and, and things like that. Uh, he controls those things, but he controls so much more than that. He rules over all things. He, he rules all the events and the happenings. And the happen that, that ever happens to me, his child. He rules all the happenings of my life, whether they're big or small, good or evil, all my struggles, all my pains, all my tragedies. He's in it. In all things, God works. He works all things for good in behalf of his dear children. The King James Version of Romans 8.28 says, And we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And we said that the words work together is huge, that it encompasses a lot. It means to create and eliminate, to place and replace, to connect and regroup. It means to interrelate and intermingle, to shape and forge, to press and stretch, to move and operate, to control and guide, to arrange and influence. God is involved in every little detail of our lives. Only God, only he can connect the dots where they fit into the big picture. And only he sees the big picture. Daily, moment by moment, God is arranging and rearranging all things for the believer's good. And, and to make it even personal, each one of us can say that he is arranging and rearranging all things for my good. And because he is all powerful, all knowing, and he is everywhere, God misses nothing. Nothing goes under the radar. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He never takes a break. He never goes on vacation. So humanly speaking, he always has me on his mind. All things work together for good. That word good means for the ultimate good, which means for the greatest good the final good. It, it means for the eventual good, for the supreme good. It means for the best of all possible goods. That's good. When I was in school, my English teacher would sometimes give us uh, several difficult to understand sentences. And, and our assignment would be to diagram the sentence, which was a task that I hated. 
It, it consisted of taking every word of the sentence and tell its relationship or the structure, how it was involved in the sentence. What is the subject? What is the verb? What is the preposition? The object of the preposition, the adjective, and so forth. For me, it required that I read and reread the sentence several times to place each word correctly on the diagram. Then, if done correctly, that sentence, which started out being difficult to understand, made sense. Romans 8 and 28. I'm not going to I'm, I'm not going to diagram it. I'm sure that if I if I tried, I would make a mess of it and confuse you. But it's one of those verses that because we've heard it repeated so many times, it's easy to just run through it. Most of us know it by heart. And, and so it's just easy to run through it without allowing it to kind of lay on the diagram of our minds for understanding. So, so with diagramming or dissecting the verse in mind, I'm going to suggest that we kind of step back and, and take another look at the parts that we've already discussed thus far. <clears throat> and, and, and that is, and we know that all things work together for good. Everything that we have discussed thus far in the eighth chapter of Romans was a process to move us to the summit, to move us to the mountaintop. Paul had, in a direct and, and detailed fashion, has taken us to the mountaintop. And, and, and up on the mountaintop, we can look out and see the assurances of God. For, for those who have been with us from the beginning in our uh, 8 o'clock Bible study each Sunday morning, prior to the COVID-19, um, we started out our freedom trail, uh, I'll call it, with Romans, the, the eight chapter, verses one through four. And, and we discussed freedom from judgment, that, that we, there's no condemnation for those who are believers. And, and then next we went to verses five through 17, which was freedom from defeat. And that we had no obligation to the flesh. We didn't have to do what the flesh, we don't have to do what the flesh tells us to do. And we're free from defeat. Then to our current verse, 18 through 30, we have freedom from discouragement. We don't, we, we don't have a reason to be frustrated. And based on all of that, all that has been said thus far, Paul makes a declaration which starts with, and we know. He, he's saying, considering all the freedoms that we have, he says, we and we know. There ought to be some things that you just know. It, it's, it, some things ought to be not up for debate. You know that you know that you know. You just know it. And, 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 and as our uh, previous pastor used to say, wake me up, shake me two o'clock in the morning and ask me the stuff that I know, I know. And, and so he says, Paul says, we know that all things work together for good. I, I, Ivanka Trump made what I call an out loud dumb statement. And you would think that that she would have had better sense, but but not so. She made the statement and, and she kind of made it with with some assurance, some base, or whatever. Uh, and and she said to all those people, all the people who were out of a job and were now because of COVID nineteen, she said they should just go and find another job. To which people responded, that's easy for you to say, being that you never, ever, ever in your life had to look for a job. 
That's not the case with Paul. When Paul says, and we know all things work together for good, he really did know. History has it that Paul wrote the book of Romans from Corinth, from Corinth uh, on his third missionary journey. And at, by this time, by his third missionary journey, which means he had a first one, he had a second one, he had a third one, and, and he had a fourth one. But by the time he was writing Romans, it was his third missionary journey. So by this time, Paul had experienced much persecution. He had been jailed numerous times. He had experienced being attacked by mobs. He had experienced even left for dead. He had experienced shipwrecks, all kinds of things Paul had experienced, all for the sake of the gospel. And, and, and with all that stuff in mind, in, in Philippians, from a Philippian jail, Paul wrote, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. Paul had experienced God working all things together for good. He, he, he knew what that meant when he said, and we know all things work together for good. He really did know. Now, now let's do my version of dissecting that verse again so that we can really get it. The first part says all things means he rules over all things. I, 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 I pray that every time you read this verse, every time you recite this verse, you slow down and, and, and really grasp all things means he rules all things. He rules all the events, all the happenings that happens to me, his child. He rules all the happenings of my life. Big, small, good, bad, the ugly, the pretty, whatever it is. All my struggles, all my pains, all my tragedies, he is in it. In all things, God works. The next part of the verse, work together. We said that that's huge. And it encompasses a lot. And it means past, present, and future. It means to create and to eliminate, to place and replace, to connect and group, to interrelate and intermingle, to shape and forge, to press and stretch, to move and operate, to control and guide. He's doing this to all things, to arrange and influence. It means that God takes all things and work it whichever way he needs to work it. And then for our good, all things work together for our good. And, and the final part is that that we looked at or that we're going to look at is for good. For the ultimate good. Uh, it, it, it means that God takes all things and work it whichever way he needs to work it. And, and, and he does it for our good. And, and, and that for the good, for the ultimate good, which means for the greatest good, the final good, the eventual good, for the supreme good. It means for the best of all possible goods. In, in our finiteness, we can't see the future. We can, at best, we can look back in, in our minds and, and, and see the past. And even then, we can't see all the details. We can't take a single event and, and see all the cause and the effects that comes from that one thing. 
we can't see or know the result of a chance meeting. You know how sometimes we like, yeah, I ran into the, and we think it's just a chance meeting. We, we can't, we can't take the, uh, we can't see the results of knowing what would have happened if I had taken a left instead of a right. We can't see it, but God can, and he does. And God takes all the events of our lives and work them out for our good, for our ultimate good. God will overrule and work even through the tragedies caused by sin in, in this present world to accomplish his purpose in the lives of those who love him and who has responded to his call. That should encourage us that no matter what it is that we're going through, no matter how long this COVID thing lasts, no matter, God forbid, even if Trump gets reelected, that should encourage us that, that God is working all things out for our good. That should encourage us and give us comfort during difficult times. That is and should be a great assurance. But as good as the promise is, there's always a but. There is a condition. And but you got to join us next week as we continue freedom from discouragement and no frustration. Until then, be encouraged, be safe, do wise things. Don't gather. Don't. I mean, always wear a mask. Always practice washing your hands. All these things that we we are told will do good for us. Do those things and then join us next week as we continue with freedom from discouragement, no frustrations. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for the freedoms that you're giving us. Help us, Father, to receive those freedoms and know that they are just as real today as they ever have been. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit who reminds us, who comforts us, who keeps us. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that he, he is with us always. And, and now we ask that you would show us what to do with what we've heard and then give us the courage to do it. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's it for now. And we will see you again next week. Until then. Be blessed.